I am Ineke and I'm a PhD uh, student at the University of Amsterdam. And uh, my PC has been focusing on how we can use portable genomic tools for grade ape health monitoring. We're interviewing scientists, pioneers, and bento lab users that are pushing the boundaries of biology. This video is brought to you by Bento Lab, a DNA analysis laboratory you can take anywhere. Where did you start from, and how did what was your journey to getting to this point? The, the background for my PhD is that um, all four taxa of great apes, so you have chimpanzees, bonobos, orangutans and gorillas, uh, they're all endangered or critically endangered. Um, and basically because humans and great apes are so closely genetically related, a lot of our diseases that we uh, carry can also be transmitted to great apes. So there, and there have been instances in the past where a transmission from humans to, to chimpanzees have been confirmed. Um, and there's also been separate instances of just um, a virus outbreak, uh, killing a, a local, almost decimating a local population of great apes. So why a lot of people do these kind of studies in viruses is because viruses evolve really fast. So within a few weeks, you can see kind of like in the Netherlands now, they discovered, they have proof that um, humans infected mink, um, a small kind of ferrotype animal, and then the, they, the mink infected humans again. And you can track that because the humans had a certain, you know, um, genetic footprint almost. The minks had a slightly different one. And then there were humans that had one that was was slightly different from the mink one but even more different from the human one so in in that kind of way with viral pathog pathogen uh, genomics you can track um, zoonotic transmission why are nematodes a problem what is the problem that you're kind of trying to tackle if, if a, a nematode transfers from humans to great apes genetically there will be this the same type of um, the pathogen or nematode so you it will be harder to prove that this transmission found place but there is research being done in that and there is like yeah there there's evidence that suggests that these kind of transfers happen it's just harder to prove genetically um but but it is um research that a lot of people are interested in because it's like i think uh, I didn't really know this because my background is not in parasitology, but before, like when I started my PZ, I realized that nematodes is, is kind of like a ne neglected tropical disease because there's in a lot of areas of the world, uh, uh, parasite infections are still really, really uh, widespread health problems. Um, and especially if you have wild animals um, that are also infected with these parasites, um, the humans in the same regions can also Inf get infected so it does happen it's just a bit harder to prove with genetics because they they evolve uh, less fast a lot of the databases that are being built up upon which all the genetic research um, um, is based uh, they're so globally northern centric so to say so if we can get more of the bentolab the minine out to different parts of the world we can complement um databases and you know then you can maybe even see oh maybe the nematodes we thought were all the same species there's much more variety than we initially thought but we don't know that now because well especially with nematodes everybody work on works on c elegance you know like um if, if we would just in my opinion if we just sequence all the nematodes we would have a perfect database and you could answer all the questions <laughs> Um, and it's interesting how that shift happens. I think if you're in the research longer, you start with a very specific question and the longer you're in there, the more you see the bigger picture and you realize actually that question is interesting, but it's dependent on all these other steps. So, yeah. What were the, the orangutan sanctuary in, in Indonesia where you were working? What, why were they interested in sampling? The orangutans. The, the Sumatran Orangutan Conservation Program is, a, is an NGO in Indonesia and they work on the Indonesian island of Sumatra. Um, so you have, there are three species of orangutans, the Sumatran orangutan, Tapanuli orangutan and the Bornean orangutan. And um, basically the Sumatran and the Tapanuli orangutan live on the island of Sumatra. And um, the SOCP, this NGO, they are the primary uh, 
point of care for if there is any orangutan that is either wild and in a very bad health condition or uh, has been um, captured as an uh, illegally traded animal um, and, and needs to be um, kind of like nursed back to good health. So they have a quarantine center where the orangutans come in there and initially when they come in they're isolated um, and they, they the veterinarians look after their health and then as soon as they're healthy enough they're being put in social cages and then as soon as they're like social enough and they have kind of shown in their behavior that they can be released back into the wild then SOCP has two designated nature reserves where these orangutans can be released back into the wild. So they do a lot of veterinary research uh, on site, um, but this is mostly been the traditional veterinarian part. But one of the things they're really interested in now is to, um, they found that the orangutans are on a really different diet in the quarantine center than when they're being released into the wild. The, 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 like in the quarantine center, they get fruits, they get veggies, they, you know, they get other types of leaves because where they are, where the quarantine center is, there's different types of vegetations. But when they're being released, they really have to live mostly on the, on the, the fruits that are local there. Um, if there's, if it's not, if there's not a lot of fruits, then they have to live of, of the leaves there and they, often see that there's a, a period where the digestive system of the orangutan has to shift almost. Um, and this is why they want to look at the microbiome of the orangutans to see if that says anything about the diet requirements and, and if with studying or keeping a track of the microbiomes of the different orangutans, uh, if they can use that to inform what kind of diet an individual orangutan is, yeah, can, can have. Uh, so that's actually something that they told me yesterday they've got funding for um, and they're looking to use Spencer Lab for that. So, um, yeah, I think that would be really, uh, really cool. In terms of some of the science, like, is there any particularly interesting aspect of some of the science that you've been doing that you think you'd like to share? Like for me, my whole PhD has been about using these portable genetic tools, right? Like using the Bento Lab, using the Minion. So for me, everyone is using these tools because <laughs> in my little niche of scientific research, everybody is using portable labs. But then when I kind of step outside of that bubble and talk to people, they're kind of like, whoa wait you can fit a whole molecular lab into a suitcase and then you can take it anywhere that's really cool and um like the the veterinarians in indonesia they they have a, a well-equipped veterinarian lab um and then they said that they had never ex expected them to be able to do molecular biology on in their clinic because they said all we know about is molecular equipment being so big and and also very expensive that it's impossible for us to do molecular biology in our lab. Um, and being able to show them that, well, actually there is this portable lab and there are portable tools now, and you know, you can also use them uh, was really cool because um, it just, it brings the cost down and it makes it more accessible. And, and that just makes me really happy to see these people so interested and curious. And I mean, there've been multiple researchers that do a lot of field work that I've talked to that have been like, whoa, we have so much trouble. Like, like again, Indonesia is very interesting because the country, I think, exists out of 300 islands, something like that. And between the main islands, researchers have difficulty sending samples from a field site to a field site. So even if you're a local Indonesian researcher and you want to send your one samples from, from one place to another place to get them sequenced, for example, it, it's logistically challenging. Um, so if then you can just have all your equipment in your own lab, then you you bypass all these kind of barriers. And for me, uh, I think that's been one of the yeah the coolest parts. That that especially one of my one of my supervisors he worked um, with. Uh, he did his PhD like three years ago or something, and he was just like, man, the way we sequenced back then is like. It's just almost unfair that you get to have all this cool equipment now and everything is so like easy. It still takes a lot of practice, but like for me to hear reactions like that it is really is really fun because it kind of makes me realize like, oh yeah, even though for me it's kind of normal now, um, 
it's it's worthwhile to share this with a lot of people because it's not very widespread yet. What has been challenging? What has been difficult? I think this is a very personal one, uh, but I think it's some that uh, one that a lot of researchers might be able to associate it themselves with, but maybe just people. I think when I started my PhD, I had, I had a lot of fear of failure. Like I was just like, I really wanted to get it right. Um, like, you know, you want to do a scientific experiment. You want to, you don't want to mess it up. Um, stuff costs money. You don't want to, you know, waste any money. Um, but it's really hard to become a good scientist if you're afraid of failure. It's just, I think it's almost impossible. <laughs> um, so I think overcoming that fear of failure and realizing now, yeah, well, this is what science is about. It's about trying stuff, being curious, uh, not being afraid to make a mistake because whatever mistake you've made, you will have learned from it. And, you know, very silly example, but like one of the first time, I mean, I, I so I did an undergraduate in molecular biology as well, like the, bio, the medical biology, it, it had some, I did DNA extractions, all these things, but my master's and, and most of my undergrad was focused on animal behavior and ecology. So when I first got back in the lab, it was like years ago that I had done molecular biology and I started this new, I used this new DNA extraction kits and I had to add some ethanol to one of the tubes. It was like a wash buffer, you add a bit of ethanol and then you have the, the right mixture. And I added not enough and I had used a bit. So it like, I was like, almost like, oh no, that's so silly. I added three milliliters instead of 30 milliliters. And you kind of like, are just like, oh man, I'm such a, a shit scientist. <laughs> this is not helpful. But then like you make that mistake once. This is also what my supervisor said. He said, you'll never make this mistake again. No, I have not made this mistake ever again. So it's kind of like taking, yeah, I think just learning that you can laugh about your mistakes. You don't have to take yourself so serious. We're all just trying our best. Uh, we're, we're trying to be curious. We're trying to answer some questions. Um, and I've kind of phrased it to my friends. I think a PhD is a personal development scheme, um, like masked as science, because <laughs> I just think like, you just become, yeah, uh, well, a better person. Not everybody becomes a better person, but you, you learn to, uh, you get to know yourself really well um, and you get to do science on the side. It's great. <laughs> I think I can strongly sympathize with some of those feelings, even not, uh, even just with the company, like not doing a PhD, but just you end up spending so much time fighting yourself instead of actually fighting the issues that you're trying to deal with. Um. Yeah, that's it. Yeah. And I think one of the things I also realized, like, it's so easy to forget these things because when we like, for example, if you guys make a story out of this and, and people read my story, they're like, oh, cool. That's, you know, everything went smooth. That's kind of how it feels, because obviously when we share our stories, we focus on what went right and the successes because we want to show what kind of advances we've made. but there have always been challenges to overcome like yeah like you said with the comp with your company as well like uh, there's a lot of invisible challenges that people often forget about once they see success stories but even if people whether people are talking about it or not the, whenever they've accomplished something that's worth accomplishing you can bet that they've had a lot of challenges that they overcame it's just not always visible um so it always makes the comparing the comparing so seductive of like oh but they are there and i'm here yeah but you know you know exactly what kind of challenges you're going through but you can't see what other people are going through so to to kind of like go through that and overcome these personal challenges of like well i'm doing a good job i'm i know i'm doing my best and that's it i think that's been the biggest challenge to overcome uh, in the in the science so far actually where do people find you and how can they follow your work well, so um, I have a personal blog that I just write sometimes about about these kind of personal things as well of like how we can sometimes dismiss ourselves or things like that. So if people want to follow me on that, then it's inekeknot.nl. It's in English and in Dutch. I try to write bilingual. Um, and um, I'm I, I'm on Instagram for that. It's inekeknot.nl. Uh, I'm on Twitter. That's at ieknot. Um, and uh, one of the things that I thought was interesting to talk about, which is what we, uh, we'll talk about a bit more, but um, is that I'm in the process of putting together a website with kind of resources on how people can get started with the Portable Genomic Lab. Um, 
So I'm giving a tutorial about that next month. Uh, there's a platform called Wild Labs. It's a, a platform um, that connects um, people that work with technology that can benefit wildlife. Um, so they're doing a whole tech tutors series and I'm, I'm giving a tutorial on the 13th of August on um, like how do I do portable genetics in the field. Um, and, um, and linked to that, we're hoping to launch a website called portablegenomics.org. Uh, it's not live yet, but I hope it will be live around that date um, for people to kind of just be like, hmm, this sounds interesting, but how do I actually get started? Um, yeah, we're hoping to get some resources up there where people can just um, get some of their answers, uh, answers question, uh, some of their questions answered. Um, and then the SOCP right now, the the, uh, the NGO in Indonesia, they are um, trying to do a fundraiser to because they are, yeah, putting a lot of safety procedures in in place for um, protecting the orangutans from the COVID nineteen. Um, so they have a just giving page, and if you don't mind, I'll, I'll give the link to you because then uh, if people feel like they they are like, oh, I, you know, I, I love what they do, and I, I really want to support them financially, it would be great if people could just, um, yeah. if they have the financial means, to share some money um, and help them protect the orangutans. That would be really cool. If you're interested in accessible biotechnology, please follow us by subscribing to our channel. You can find out more about Inica's work in the description below. Thanks and see you next week.